Hello and welcome back, friends. I hope you are having a great day. Jason here to bring you another story only here, sorry what. As usual, grab a cup of your favorite drink, get comfortable, and let us begin. This is my story. I am Thomas Potsy Potter, Tom. I am a half an inch short of six foot sandy blonde hair. I had played sports in high school, wasn't considered a jock there, but at state college, I saw my limitations and turned to my studies. I was told by a couple girls that I had it what it was, I really did not know. I had a couple of high school romances, and two, my freshman year. Otherwise, I had been dating airheads and that got tiring fast. Melons do not mean brains, and as for sex, melons are great, but melons don't say much after the heavy breathing is over, and you realize you are lying next to nothing but a cum collector. Celeste and I had met during my sophomore year of college. I was an orientation leader for the incoming freshmen, and I was also a resident assistant, RA. I had a group of two girls and three guys under my care, six was the average size of the groups. Celeste had arrived late and was literally the last person to be assigned to any group, almost all groups had left the student union to start the campus walking tour. My group was about to leave for our first tour of campus, and I saw Celeste from the back, and I could tell she was crying. I told the orientation coordinator, I have room for one more. Celeste turned to look at me. Her eyes were misted over, but quickly turned to deep, sparkling blue pools that I wanted to just swim in. It was love at first sight. The start of something good. It took the orientation coordinator about 10 minutes to finish signing in Celeste. By the end of the day, all my group was tired. We had walked all over campus, to Timbuktu and back, as a couple of my out-of-shape charges put it. We broke for the day and headed for the dining hall. I sat down by myself, so I could do the ducking bullshit report that was required. I understood it was a necessary evil, but the Valley Girl Orientation team leaders wanted a Barbie and Ken type of report. When talking about it, they punctuated it with the words. Like, whatever, totally, as if, oh my god, and the always annoying for sure. I think they were the ones who would probably oversee our class reunions in the future. I hope that I'd be busy. May I sit with you? It was Celeste. I almost couldn't get the word, yes. Out fast enough. Celeste said she felt alone because of coming so late. She said she hadn't even unpacked yet, as most of the freshmen had arrived the day before. As she talked, I had started to think of names for our future children. Celeste was blonde, petite, did I mention her sparkling eyes. She stood about 5 foot 4 inches tall and had a supermodel's figure, if models were shorter. After eating our salads, she opened up about her life. Her parents were killed when an armed robber, being chased by the police, hit their car. Celeste was visiting her grandma at the time, so was not with her parents. Her grandmother died just a couple of years later. She had just aged out of foster care having turned 18 in August. She'd been in a string of foster homes, her first foster parents had unexpectedly gotten pregnant and wanted to concentrate on their new baby. With the second foster family, her foster father visited her one night and molested her. His wife divorced him, and he was in jail, and had been molested a few times here by Bubba. She was with her third foster family the longest, where it was like a real family, well almost, her foster mom had been in the fashion industry, and had kept Celeste looking gorgeous. Her foster father was an executive, and he had had an affair with his gold-digging secretary. Her foster parents had divorced just before she left for college. Wow. That, besides the dinner, was a lot to digest. We talked till the cleanup crew threw us out, so we walked back to our dorms. I should say that we lived in the same dorm, myself with all the men on the first floor, and Celeste on the women's floor, the second floor. Because of her late arrival, she did not have a roommate. I did not have a roommate because I was a RA. I walked her to her room. When she opened her door, I saw all the unpacking she still needed to do. I said, you want any help? Just then, her RA, Sue, popped out of the RA's room. Hey, Tom, so you decided to visit the penthouse. Oh, so you are Celeste. I am Sue, your RA, come to me anytime. Well, only when I am not sleeping. Okay, Tom, why are you here? I am Celeste's orientation leader, she is one of my pride. Yeah, sure, lion boy, haha. We entered her room. She had a bunch of stuff on her bed. I decided to take a leap and I told her, it is getting late, you need to go to bed, so let's clear your bed and put away the stuff you have on your bed and make a path. It took almost two hours to clear her bed and put her stuff and clothes away correctly. When we finished, Celeste sat on her bed and then fell back with her arm over her eyes. I noticed she had started to cry. She said, this reminds me of when I was first in the system when my grandmother died. She then asked me to hold her. I lay down next to her and took her in my arms. She basically melted into me and cried her eyes out. We fell asleep. I was awakened with a shoulder shake. It was Sue. 
She had peeked in the unlocked door, saw the coast was clear and came in, she said, You have morning death duty, lion boy. Oh she. I jumped up, I looked in Celeste's mirror, finger combed my hair, straightened my shirt out, and said goodbye, as I ran out the door. Later, Sue came to relieve me. Tom, you are quite the gentleman. There you were with a vulnerable, gorgeous, beautiful young lady, and you didn't even kiss her. Hey, Sue, it wouldn't have been right. Tom, I know you. I remember you holding me the night my grandmother died. Celeste is okay and she is truly grateful. For me, like I said, it was love at first sight. How did it happen? It was the color of her hair, the beauty in her eyes, the sunshine in her smile, those red lips I wanted to kiss, and most important she had brains. All I knew was that she was my dream girl. Thus, we started our life together. We spent many nights together, either her room or mine. The next two years, we spent most of our time together in my room since she then had roommates. When I graduated, I proposed. I lucked out and was hired by a very successful company. We lived together during her senior year. We married the week after Celeste graduated. I was surprised when Celeste had a prenup drawn up, she was very nonchalant about it, I was in love, so I did not think anything about it. Celeste got her teaching certificate. We discovered what married sex life was like. Our lovemaking was varied and frequent, we lovingly touched each other, and often. It was like we were attached at the hip. If we weren't working, we were together, we even showered together as often as we could. I expanded the shower so we could comfortably hold and wash each other. We were married about a year when she told me we were going to be parents, and that we were going to have twins. God, I was on cloud nine. People said you could see the aura of love that enveloped us. She stopped teaching a month before she was due, and never was to teach again. When the time came Celeste wanted to have a natural birth, but the doctor convinced her to have a C-section. We named the twins Thomas Jr. and Celeste Jr., Sully. Months before, the doctor had shared with Celeste's mom in this news. Celeste had cancer. She chose to hold off treatment until the babies were born. Celeste did not tell me. A few days after the birth, Celeste asked me to accompany her to a doctor's appointment. The doctor's name I did not recognize, but I read the office door, it said, Doctor of Oncology. I looked at Celeste. She said, wait till we see the doctor. The doctor explained all about the cancer and the treatment they would be using, and what her odds of recovery were, he tried to hide that it was a small number. Celeste calmly said, no. Just keep me comfortable. I know I am dying, I will live for my children, and I know I have a husband who is my soulmate, and he loves me to the end of the world and back. I know, even with treatment, my odds are very slim. I sat there shot, my soulmate just told me I was losing her. When we got home, Celeste sat me down with one of those big banker's boxes. Tom, honey, this is my treasure box. It has all my legal papers, my new will, our marriage certificate, all our birth certificates and my trust papers. That is why I needed the prenup, my trust is from my parents' and grandmother's deaths. I looked at her. Trust. Is there enough money in the trust to get your treatment? Yes, but the treatment will not help me now, it will just cause my hair to fall out, poison me and poison my breast milk. Thomas, my love, I have thought about this for months. I will be able to keep breastfeeding the twins for quite a while. Thomas, my trust will become yours to use as you wish when I die. I do have property in the trust. My parents' home and my grandmother's home. They have been rented all these years with the trust taking care of the properties and paying taxes and upkeep everything. All income from the rentals was put in the trust. The trust is now at a point that if you sell the homes, you and the children could live on it without you having to work much. We will put our house in the trust also, so everything will be protected. Grandma was smart when she set up the trust. One thing her will made sure of, was that my foster families would not know about it, family services didn't even know. Heck, I did not know about it till I was accepted to college, and found it was all paid for. Celeste pleaded, you have to promise me that you will not languish with my death, and you will find love again, and find a mommy for my babies. Now, my babies are asleep, I need you to love me. I did my best to fulfill her wish of loving her and making love to her in the months that followed, she asked me many times to help her feel loved. I took pictures of Celeste at every opportunity. I bet I averaged 50 pictures a week. I even took pictures of the children, so I could put them in her casket with her when the time came. It was two weeks after the twins' first birthday, that I had to put Celeste into hospice, she hung on for two more months. On the day she died, I had our infants with me, and I laid both children on Celeste's chest. They were very still, almost as if they knew what was happening. Tears were in Celeste's eyes. I heard a whisper, I love you, my babies. She looked at me and in a low voice told me, you are the most loving person I have ever met, you are my soulmate. I love you, please live for our babies and find love again. 
Within minutes, the heart monitor's alarm sounded. Celeste had a DNR, and the nurses came in, let me kiss my Celeste one last time, and handed me my children. I left, drove home, fed the children, called my second cousin, Linda, and I lay down, holding my now motherless children. My door was opened by my second cousin, Linda. She and I were close in age, and had been just simply close since childhood. Celeste had been teaching at the same school where Linda was teaching not planned, it was just the way it happened. Linda was married to a guy I hated, he was a narcissist and had to have all the attention on himself. He was jealous of Linda and my family's relationship. He even was jealous of his own daughter. The whole family walked on eggshells around him, so as not to set him off. Linda only came to realize this when her daughter was born, just days after the twins were born. Both Linda and Celeste were pregnant at the same time, and they had become best friends, not just in-laws. Celeste and Linda were almost like sisters at times, so close I think they finished each other's sentences more times than not. Linda took the children and put them in one crib so they would have each other. She went to the guest room and put on a bathing suit she kept there to use when she used our pool. I was in a trance. She then took me to the bathroom and stripped me down and washed me in the shower. I didn't realize that I was getting washed, or even that I was naked. Linda dressed me in shorts and a t-shirt and put me to bed. Linda called more family, my sisters, my brothers and all my cousins. The kids and I became a family project, my family or their spouses took shifts for the next six months, taking care of me and my twins. Linda coordinated all of it. Linda looked a lot like Celeste, but she was taller, the color of her hair, the beauty of her deep blue eyes, a smile that was like the sunshine, ruby red lips that begged for kissing. Yes, that is how I had seen my cousin from the time I was a teenager, and how I saw Celeste. I took off a year from work, well I quit. When the will was read and all the paperwork was done, I found out I didn't need to work for at least 10 years, if I didn't want to. I became a stay-at-home dad. By the time the twins were in preschool, I had gone through counseling and thought I was ready to meet the outside world, and, maybe, date. I was set up with friends of friends, friends of relatives, friends of neighbors, relatives of neighbors. I had a couple nannies, one seemed to have ulterior motives. I just couldn't find a woman that met my criteria. I started doing online research, it paid, and since I was good, I had more than enough clients, mostly college students, that would rather pay me handsomely to do research. During this time, I also got my MBA almost totally online. By the time my twins and Linda's daughter were in fourth grade, Linda had divorced her asshole husband for cheating. Linda kept teaching the whole time during the divorce. The couple family members and I caught her cheating ex-husband coming out of a bar alone and kicked the sheep out of him. We had friends vouch for us that we were in a bar with them. The ski masks did help, too, haha. I never felt so good about breaking the law. We all showed up in court to support Linda. The judge did not like his narcissistic mug either and ruled in favor of Linda on almost everything. The asshole had the nerve to show up with his girlfriend. The judge was not impressed. Unbelievably, he did not ask about child visitation at all. This did not sit well with the judge. The judgment was so bad that his gold digger girlfriend broke up with him, stomped out of the courtroom, and never saw him again. He had to keep working and eating ramen and mac and cheese for a couple of years to get on top of his debts he ducked and deserved it. About this time, I started to work again. I was brought in by friends as a partner into a company, which was in the field I had expertise in. It was a big office, where there was a virtual smorgasbord of secretaries, receptionists, and female office clerks. Most of the unmarried women shied away from me because of my children's seat is not just men who do that. I tried to keep my nose to the grindstone. One secretary, Cynthia, seemed to latch on to me after a couple of months. I was blinded by her charms, as the song goes, I was bewitched, bothered and bewildered. I did not see that she was the classic gold digger, she was attentive, fantastic in bed and looked good on my arm. Seggs was out of this world, and she never seemed to get enough. Many times, it seemed I was lacking enough blood in my head to think straight. She even fooled me with her false attention with the twins. I was stupefied. In six months, we got married. Linda had my back and sent me to her lawyer who drew up a hell of a prenup, ironclad, unbreakable. Cynthia's gold-digging mother, who was on her 6-M-A-R-R-I-A-G, assured her that all prenups were breakable, so Cynthia signed. My kids never bonded with her, and always called her by her name Cynthia, never Cindy and never mom. Other than a little bit of I am a pretty girl latitude, I did not see anything wrong just proves that men could and would be stupid when it came to being infatuated by the opposite sex. The company had me transfer her out of my office to keep the fraternization policy, my partners and I drew up, intact. As one partner said, better safe than sorry. How prophetic. We were now working in different offices a couple of miles apart. 
Cindy would drive herself to work, and I'd drive the kids to school. We seemed to have a good marriage, we spent time together. We had friends, I saw football, baseball games with the guys. Cindy had occasional girls' nights out with the girls from the office, and a couple were from my office. A couple of the girls' nights out did not include the girls in my office, and so I was going to ask Cindy about it. But before I could talk to her about the girls' nights sheep happened. One day when the kids were in 6th grade, after Cindy had left for work Thomas Jr. did not feel well, so I told him he could stay home, and I'd call later, to see how he was. At about 10am Thomas Jr. heard a noise. Knowing Cindy and I were supposed to be at work, he grabbed his baseball bat, and he silenced his phone before he opened his door. He heard Cindy's voice and one of a man. Thomas Jr. was only in middle school, but he knew something was not right. The voices led him to the master bat. He was hidden behind the doorframe and was able to get pictures through the open doorway, and then one as they got out of the shower, all without being seen. He snuck back to his room. Kids can be so sneaky. He texted me with the picture. I was shocked. The pictures were P.I. quality. They were oblivious to Thomas Jr.'s presence. The guy worked in her office under her managerial control, in other words, he worked for my company. Like fools, they left the bedroom door open, too. Thomas Jr. got another clear shot of her on the bed with him. Thomas Jr. must have hated her, as only an 11-year-old could, his hate made his covert pictures magazine quality. I checked my family locator, and it showed both Thomas Jr. and Cindy were in the house. I texted Thomas Jr. and told him to get out of the house, now, and wait on the corner for Aunt Linda. I called Linda, told her the Reader's Digest version, and asked her to pick up Thomas Jr. since the school was nearby. She told the principal it was a family emergency, the principal took her classes. Calling Linda was the best thing I could have done. Linda did not just pick up Thomas Jr., but told him to stay in the car as she snuck into the house with her digital camera. In the nearly 20 or so minutes she spent spying on the two cheating assholes, Linda got almost porn quality pictures from the open doorway. While she hid behind the doorframe, she was able to get them in all the different positions they tried. How she kept from grabbing Thomas Jr.'s bat, I didn't know. She left as quietly as she had entered. Linda called me and told me to meet her at our lawyer's office, a Ronald Overly Esquire. When Ronald saw the pictures, he said he would use the pictures Thomas Jr. took because Thomas Jr. lived there and had a reason to be in the house, Thomas Jr. could take all the pictures he wanted to. Since he was a minor, Ronald said, I might be able to threaten filing charges, but along with Linda's pictures, we will have leverage. He drew up divorce papers on the spot, and they were good ones, he knew his stuff, after all, he was the lawyer who did my prenup. He had a template for the petition for divorce for cheating spouses. He made edits to fit my situation, and it took only about an hour to come up with the divorce papers ready to serve her. He had done it several times before in his practice. He called a process server. He asked me where Cindy was right then. I checked my phone, and she was back at work. That's when I reminded him, she worked for me and so did the scumbag. Ronald got on the phone and called our in-house lawyer, and let him know what was going to happen. When he hung up, he said, you did want them fired, right? They were on company time also, this is an at-will employment state you can fire and hire anyone for almost no reason at all. I can really do that. Yes, you have an anti-fraternization policy, on company time in your employment contracts, your company started it just a couple of years ago. That was after you two got married. That is why you had to transfer her to the other office to keep you out of trouble. Give me a moment, and I'll do an alienation of affection suit for the office Lothario. I understand he is married. It may not go anywhere, but I love doing those, so that will be pro bono unless he pays, haha. <laughs> do I send anything to his wife? Yes. Send away. Linda took Thomas Jr. home and waited for Sully and her own daughter, Sally, to get home. I could just hear Katy Perry's fireworks. I walked into my branch office about 4 p.m. Cindy looked up at me and smiled. Hi honey. Hi Cynthia. I tried to look nonchalant. The company lawyer and the head of HR and the process server walked in a couple minutes after me. We were just lucky the Lothario was sitting in his nearby office cubicle. Next, three security officers walked in. Cindy had no idea of the sheepload that was going to land on her duck and gold digging head. The biggest security officer stood nonchalantly in front of the asshole's doorway. The female security officer walked down the hallway a little way, again, nonchalantly. The third security officer picked a chair by the door, sat down, picked up a magazine, and pretended to read it. The process server stepped up and asked, Are you Cynthia Ann Potter? She said, Yes. She handed her the papers and said in the sweetest voice, You've been served, sugar and took a picture. The head of HR stepped up and handed her the termination with cause papers. 
The company lawyer told her she had one hour to leave the building and that the security officer, Mary Jane, would stay with her for that hour. The asshole just then stepped to his office doorway and was met by the process server. The process server asked him, who the hell are you? Like the bustard that he is, he said, Robert Williamson. He had his name badge on. She handed him the lawsuit papers and said, you have been served. She took his picture. Normally, you don't get served with those lawsuit type papers, but Ronald thought it would add a good touch to it all. They charged him the same way as Cindy, handing him the termination with cause papers. Security officer Willie will escort you off the property. Cindy found her voice and shouted, why? I growled, look at the pictures my underage son took of you and deckhead. She flipped to the pages where the pictures were and collapsed. The third security officer caught her before she hit the floor. When she came to, I loved seeing her head jerk as the smelling salts were waved under her nose. I told her, there will be a police officer at the house for a civil standby, will you get your things? I own the house. Back home, there was not just one officer but three, two male officers and a female officer, in full uniform, guns and tasers, too. Ronald had ordered them and I was paying their moonlighting pay. I gave them coffee. When Cindy showed up four hours later, her mom was with her, and both immediately began to scream and shouting about what a bustard I was. I just smiled. They quieted down when the female officer came out. Then the other two officers walked out. The female officer had the divorce papers and the order of no contact in her hands. It is alright here ma'am, you do have a copy, correct? She told her that they, the officers are here to keep the peace. She said that she, Cindy Potter, had a reasonable time to remove her belongings, but she, the officer, will decide what is reasonable. The female office sounded so legal-like, she had just been sitting at my kitchen table just minutes before, drinking coffee and talking about her kids, while I told her about my twins. Linda, Sully, and Sally had come over and packed up just about everything that Cindy had at the house in boxes and bags, as almost 99% of the house contents were mine from before the marriage. It took about six hours, two before Cindy was served, and the four before she got there. While packing Cindy's things, Sully and Sally found a stash of cash, three bundles of $100 bills, $300,000. Cindy was hiding from me. I knew there was no way she could have earned and or saved that much, I signed her paychecks. I later found out that she had slowly and secretly embezzled it from me in the few years we were married. It looked like her mother had a hand in it. She had embezzled it out of one of my accounts that was indirectly connected with the trust. She had somehow gotten into it. She had kept it in cash, so as not to draw attention at the bank with a big balance. Oh, she was good. I felt safe then because I had changed all my passwords and had taken her name off the accounts that she had no business being on. She had drained the joint account long before I had caught her cheating. I changed the home access code. When Cindy went to her hiding place, we heard, oh sheep. She came downstairs and looked at me, and said, you bustard, that money was my safety stash because of that ducking prenup. All I said was, what money? She raised her hand like she was going to slap me, but pulled it down when the female officer came into the room. Linda and me. Linda and I consoled each other when we needed a shoulder to cry on. We had a lot of dinners, both with our families, and with just ourselves when we needed just our hearts mended with the company of our best friend. We actually were dating. Yes, the whole eight and a half months before the divorce got to the hearing. If you can believe it we got even closer. The court hearing. It was all over but the shouting, the shouting in the courthouse, that is. The hearing was the Thursday before the Christmas holidays. Cindy's mother thought Cindy had a claim on the house. Ronald laughed. Cindy's mother got her lawyer to try to fight the prenup. Ronald just laughed again and told me he would just ask the judge to have Cindy pay his fees. Ronald also told me this was the judge that ruled on Linda's divorce. The real clincher Ronald was going to get the judge to order that Cindy had to pay for Thomas Jr.'s counseling after witnessing his stepmother's infidelity. With that, Cindy dropped all objections to the prenup and signed away all claims to monies. I gave her $20,000 of her stolen money as a going away gift. That burned her ass. My children and Sally had come to court with me just in case there were any questions they might be able to help with. Cindy's mother came at me after court and Sully stepped in front of her. Well, Sully was almost 5 foot 10 in the 8th grade. Her beauty came from her mother, but her height was from me. Cindy's mom fell on her ass and started to scream that Sully had pushed her down, but a court bailiff had seen the whole thing and told a deputy sheriff to put handcuffs on Cindy's mom. Home at last. We left for home. We were all at my house. Linda, Sally, Thomas Jr., Sully, and myself. The kids being kids started to tell stories. Some were about Cindy. The kids had heard some of the stories before, but still laughed like it was the first time hearing them. 
Thomas Jr. took this time to tell us he wanted to go by Tom Jr. or just Tom from then. I suggested Linda and Sally stay the night. Silly said, yes. Linda said, okay. The kids ran out of gas at about 11 p.m. Linda and I told the kids they could stay home tomorrow since it was Friday and nothing would be happening the day before the Christmas holiday. Linda had taken two personal days leave for the trial, so she also had Friday off. She and I were still pumped from the day. Linda said, let's watch some movies. Okay, I looked at the downstairs TV, and it was still hooked up to the PS5. Linda said, doesn't your TV in your bedroom have the movies on it? Yeah, let's go up there and watch. Okay, I'll grab some sodas, as neither one of us drank, and I have a big all bag of popcorn. I climbed the steps two at a time. Linda had gotten into bed still clothed and pulled the blanket up to her middle. I climbed into bed with my shorts and a t-shirt on. I pulled the blanket up to my middle also. Linda started to channel surf and stopped at a channel that needed a passcode, it was the Erotic Night Moves movie channel. Linda asked what kind of channel it was. Well, Cindy liked to watch corn. I just haven't removed it yet. Linda looked at me. Hack, let's watch it. I did a double take. Okay. So we watched and then we decided we had enough of just watching. Afterwards, we got dressed and unlocked the bedroom door, and before we fell asleep, we confessed our love for each other. Both of us had more than a crush on each other since our teenage years. That crush had become full-blown love. When we woke up, we could hear the kids whispering. Sally was telling Tom, and Linda is in bed with Dad. Sally asked with a hushed what. Tom said, look, the TV is still on, and it is the Hallmark channel, and they are fully dressed. Sally said, I think my mom likes your dad. Sully said, you know they are not like other aunts and uncles, they are not brother and sister, they are cousins, in fact, they are second cousins, kissing cousins. Sally asked, what does that mean? Tom, in typical dude matter of fact fashion, said, they can have sex and even get married. Both girls went, you, on the word sex, and then, all, on the word married. Linda and I rose from our sleep. Linda got up and said in an everyday voice, I'd better fix some breakfast, you know teenagers. I caught her wink. Do you remember how the movie ended? I fell asleep about when the town had its Christmas carnival. Linda said, hell, it is a Hallmark movie. They all lived happily ever after. We smiled at our deception. We heard some not so quiet feet headed to the kitchen. Linda and I fixed bacon and eggs and cinnamon buns. The kids were talking in teen speak about us. We could surmise that we had two and a half cupids sitting at my breakfast table. Tom was trying to act uninvolved. When the kids finished eating, I said, why don't we all spend the rest of the vacation here? We are having all the family here for Christmas dinner anyway. You know I'll need help. Both girls said at once, I'll help. Sally turned to her mom. You going to help Uncle Tom? Please mommy. Linda informed the kids, I was going to help anyway, kids. She excitedly continued, come on, Sally, Sally, let's go to the store and get some Christmas dinner supplies. We will stop and get clothes for the vacation, Sally. Before they left, I pulled Linda aside and handed her my credit card. Put the food on this, and told her to go buy the girls each a Christmas dress, and to get one for herself, too. I was sitting on the back porch by the fire pit, when the girls got back to the house about 2.30 in the afternoon. Linda came out in tears and showed me a letter from the mortgage company. It was a notice telling her the company was going to foreclose on the house, if the arrears were not brought up to date by such and such a date. Her ex was five months behind on the payments. Then she handed me a second letter from the lawyer, it said her ex had been accidentally killed, and his widow we did not even know he remarried, was not going to honor any agreement, she was washing her hands of the house. Since it was going to be foreclosed anyway, she did not want the foreclosure on her record. Linda broke down in tears. A little for the ex, but mostly for the house problem. I kicked into help mode. I called our lawyer, he grabbed his partner who was the real estate expert and put him on the phone. Linda explained what was going on, I got on the phone and said, fix it. I'll pay what is owed. He said, why don't you just buy the note? It will be way cheaper. Then you can sell the property for a big profit. That sounds great, can you do it for me? Can both of you be in the office Monday? Yes, we can. By late Monday afternoon, I was the proud owner of the loan on Linda's house once the paperwork was finished. She listed it with the realtor on Tuesday. On paper, she agreed to pay the loan off to me on sale of the house. On Wednesday, I hired a moving company to move Linda's and Sally's furniture to my house, or into storage. One thing Linda's ex did, was have life insurance that paid both Linda and his wife. 
It had the usual double indemnity clause for accidental death, but that was six to eight months away. They would split $200,000 instead of just $100,000. Before the end of the day on Wednesday, I stopped in to see mom. I told her of how Linda and I were moving in together and how we had fallen in love, it was more a 20-year stroll than a foe. Mom asked, is it legal? Mom, Linda and I are second cousins and by law, it is okay to marry your second cousin. Oh, that's right, in that case, wait right there. Mom disappeared into her bedroom and came out with a ring box. Thomas, this is the engagement ring your dad gave me when he proposed. I never gave it to you when Celeste was alive because your dad was still with us. I hated that little witch you married after we lost Celeste, so I put it away when your dad passed away. Now, I think Linda is worthy to wear it. When do you think you will propose? Mom. Now, I can do it at Christmas dinner. Most of the family will be there. Mom said, believe me, the whole family will be there. I'll make sure of it, you'll need to get more chairs and tables. That night, I got the kids to help with the dishes and told Linda to check the guest room, since we might have family needing a bed. When Linda left, I had the kids gather around me. I looked first at Sally. I am asking you first. May I have your blessing to marry your mom? I turned to my kids and asked them, may I marry Linda and have your blessing also? The girls immediately broke into tears. Tom gave me a big manly hug, he had manly tears in his eyes that became a river just like his sister and new stepsister. I thought they were going to kill me with the hugs. Not a word to anyone, not even Linda, only grandma knows. I am going to ask her before dessert at Christmas dinner. I put my hands in, the kids added theirs, and we did a goatine potter cheer. Sally was a little less loud than my kids. I had a surprise for Sally that she would receive on Saturday. Friday was organized chaos. Linda and the girls were in the kitchen cooking what could be cooked early for Christmas dinner. The extra chairs and tables arrive, Tom and I set up the portable heaters in the garage and back patio. I had 10 type walls put around the patio. My house was quite unique, as there were glass French double doors between the dining room and the patio, and between the dining room and garage. We set up tables in the garage and patio. The girls decorated the garage with the rug and tapestries, it almost did not look like I had parked two cars in it just a couple of days before. Mom came very early to help the girls, they all got talking about boys, and they were giggling the whole morning and afternoon. Linda, Sally, and Sully put on their new dresses, Tom even put on a nice shirt and tie. My sisters, brothers, their spouses and children, and every cousin and spouse who had helped when I lost Celeste were there. When Tom counted, he came up with 30 people and 3 infants. I was able to place the head of the main table so that almost all could see where I sat. Tom acted as usher, placing Linda at my right and mom at my left, with Sally next to Linda opposite Sally, and where Tom would also sit. The meal was fantastic, the food was served by Sally and Sally. Mom and Linda just beamed at the compliments and tried to give each other the credit. As the girls and Tom cleared the table of the dinner plates, I stood and asked for quiet. When I had the attention of all, except for the smallest of children, I said, I'd like to thank Mom, Sully, Sally, and most of all, Linda, for helping. Linda, stand up, please. The whole family over 35 strong applauded, and Linda started to sit. Linda, hold on, I have more things to say. I knelt taking Mom's ring out and asked, Linda will you marry me? Linda broke out with tears, nodded her head, and said, yes, yes, yes. An uproar followed. There were hugs, kisses, handshakes, happy tears, laughter. I held up my hands for quiet. I have one more question. Tom grabbed a sheaf of papers. I asked Sally to stand, as Tom slipped some of the papers that Ronald had prepared into my hand, behind my back. I, again, took a knee and asked, Sally, will you please let me adopt you and become my daughter? Sally dropped to hug me, saying, yes daddy, yes. I put my hands in, and the kids added theirs, and we did a goatine potter cheer, this time, Sally was the loudest. Then it was Tom and Sully's turn to ask for quiet. My kids walked around the table, Tom had the rest of the papers, when together they announced, we have a very important question. This question we have wanted to have answered for 15 years. Linda, will you stand up, again? Both Sully and Tom took a knee and asked Linda, will you please adopt us, so we can call you the names you have earned in our hearts, mommy, mother, and mom. Linda almost passed out, but was able to get out the answer of, yes, yes. I was bawling like a hungry baby. I looked at mom and I knew she had a hand in this part, she had gone to the lawyer for the kids. There were more hugs, kisses, handshakes, happy tears, and laughter. Only enough wine was poured for one drink per adult, so no one needed to stay over, except for mom which we planned for. When we were cleaning up, we found that there was over $1500 stuck under the dessert plates, from family. Mom laughed. 
They did that at mine at your father's engagement party. But we only saw five dollar bills. You have so many fifties and hundred dollar bills. A sign of the times. Mom. How did they know to have cash? Mom answered, ask me no questions and I'll tell no lies. Guys, to tell the truth, I told everyone that there might be a proposal, but by another family member. I swore everyone to absolute secrecy, I basically told everybody a different person was proposing before dessert. Family filed out for the next hour, leftovers were packed and given away, hugs were given, cheeks were kissed. Mom asked quickly, have you decided when yet? Wait, before you answer. Linda has until January 5th off, right? You have all the time you want since you are the boss, right? To get married by Elvis in Vegas costs $200. The plane round trip is cheap for two or even six. And rooms at this time of year are cheap. If you two want, you could fly to Vegas, get married, enjoy Vegas, and have family attend Danby nearby for around eight to $10,000. And by family, I mean me and the kids. I'll watch the kids and that way, we can all be there. Think about it. Good night. And mom scurried to the guest room. Linda and I looked at each other. I took her hand and we walked to the master bedroom. Linda said, a penny for your thoughts. Mom has a point. We could be married December 31 before midnight and celebrate our new marriage as the new year comes in. We could file all the adoption papers before we leave and I am sure it will make us a family a lot quicker since we both are surviving parents, maybe only six weeks. Linda exclaimed, that sounds wonderful and that is why I am going to make fantastic love to you tonight, Merry Christmas, honey. I was very happy with the split bedroom design of the house. The master bedroom was on the east end, and the other bedrooms were all on the west end of the house, with all the other house's rooms in between. We retired to the shower. We stripped each other and washed each other's body. We washed each other till we were wrinkled. We dried each other off. Linda took a shy girl pose, with a finger touching her teeth. What are you going to do now, Mr. Potter? On Monday, we signed the adoption papers and told Ronald to file them, since we were getting married on New Year's Eve. On Wednesday, we flew to Las Vegas the kids, mom, Linda, and me. We applied for our marriage license, where we had to fill out a form certifying we were no closer related than first cousins once removed. Mom helped certify that. The Pava tribe invaded Las Vegas. We went sightseeing, took a helicopter flight over Hoover Dam and the Grand Canyon, we went to the top of the Strat Tower. Fun was had by all. Oh, we got married, too. At 11.50pm with Elvis singing Can't Help Falling In Love. Mom had taught the kids the words and mom and the kids sang the chorus with Elvis. Mom caught the bouquet, I'll have to watch out for any boyfriend she may acquire, haha. We returned home and Linda said she wanted to take us to a special place. She blindfolded Tom, Sally, and me. She got us in the car and drove around for about 15 minutes. She led us through what felt like a grassy park, with Sally bringing up the rear to help guide us. She had some chairs placed where she led us to. We sat down quietly. We heard her talking. She was talking not to us, but was talking to Celeste. I took off my blindfold. We were in the cemetery, by Celeste's grave. And there was Linda, on her knees, in front of Celeste's tombstone. The inscription was still there. Celeste Ann Potter loving wife, loving mother. Unbeckoned to me, two new lines had been added. Loving friend, our guardian angel. I listened to Linda. After her silent prayer I heard. Celeste, I have taken care of your beloved Thomas, your handsome Thomas Jr., and your gorgeous Sully. My dearest friend, please fulfill my prayer, amen. I knelt beside her. By this time, Sally had removed her brother's and sister's blindfolds, and they, too, knelt. We took time to say our own silent prayer. Linda held my hand throughout the family prayers. Sally finished her prayer with a simple, Aunt Celeste, I love you so much, amen. Tom Jr. S. and Sully's were like they always were since they could talk, finishing their prayer with a simple, Mommy, I love you, Amen. I finished my prayer with a simple, Celeste, I love you, and I am doing okay, thank you for leading me to Linda, Amen. I wanted to know Linda's prayer, but I did not dare ask, this was something between Linda and Celeste. We settled down to family bliss. The kids began to argue like blood siblings, the girls talked about boys, Tom was not into girls yet. He was interested in how far he could hit a baseball or throw a football. He made room for girls when he hit the game-winning homer his first game as a freshman, and got a couple of hugs, and, I thought, even a little kiss on the cheek from a cute friend of his sister's, Addie, short for Adeline. As the kids entered 10th grade, I got mom to watch the kids over Labor Day weekend, basically, she was there to make sure the house didn't burn down, and that curfew was followed. She was tight and the kids knew it. She said, if I hear all grandma, I know I am doing my job. We went to a little bed and breakfast in the next town. 
We decided this was going to be the honeymoon that we did not take after our Vegas wedding. We checked in and no one saw us, except for lunch and dinner, while we were there. Which was also the only time we had clothes on. Tom played on the baseball team, football team, and yelled a lot at the girls' volleyball and basketball games. Sally and Sully both played volleyball, but Sully loved playing basketball. Remember when Linda said she was at her most fertile time when we first made love? Well, she was fertile at the bed and breakfast. We got to tell the kids that they were going to have a little sibling. We both felt that we were at the limit of our child-rearing years, we agreed no matter what, this was the last one. We had four children, three of whom could probably do some babysitting, haha. <laughs> Linda Celeste Potter was born late in the kids' sofa where you were at high school. Linda insisted on using Celeste's name. By the way, Linda Celeste Potter was what Linda prayed to Celeste for. Since I was now the president and majority owner of my company, money was no problem, so Linda became a stay-at-home mom. Senior year high school. Sally and Sully both had boyfriends that were Tom approved, his criteria was harder than mine. That friend of the girls that kissed him, Addie, became his girlfriend, they both went to state. The girls, somehow, kept it from Tom for a long time, that they decided to go to state, too. All three had scholarships. Tom in baseball, Sully in basketball, and Sally, volleyball. Tom was still the protecting brother. Cindy. Oh yeah, about Cindy. I found out that I was not the only one she embezzled from. She had embezzled from her next job, she got 5 years, 3 suspended for being a first-timer, and got out in 10 months for good behavior and overcrowding. While in prison, her mother had died. Without that bad influence, Cindy cleaned up her life and got married. She had two kids and a husband who was not only attentive to her needs, but watched her like a hawk. He has a prenup written by, yes, you guessed it, Ronald Overly Esquire. Today, we, now, are waiting for Sally and John, Sully and Bob, Tom and Addie, to arrive for Thanksgiving with our grandchildren. The grandchildren were all born within days of each other, the first week of October. We blame it on Vegas. We all had gone up to Vegas to celebrate mine and Linda's wedding anniversary at New Year's. Our kids had celebrated and had gone to bed early. You do the math. Linda Celeste is just over the moon to see her brother, sisters, nieces, and nephew. She is in middle school now, and is looking forward to babysitting to pull in the big bucks from her brother and sisters. We all sit at the Thanksgiving table. I give a short blessing. Thanksgiving is a time of family togetherness, family gratitude we thank all our family. It is a time for family remembrance we honor the lives of our departed family members. It is a time for family love we hold our family members in our hearts amen. The end.